The PUD-5 issue is not an issue so much about height and weight and length and all that sort of stuff. It's really an issue about how this town is going to manage and cope with change. One set of supporters uh, feel that it's best not to do anything, to keep things tight the way they are. Things have gone pretty well to this point. Let's leave it just that way. Others, the yes group that I'm a part of, feels that change has to be managed. It needs to be managed with respect for the traditions of the town, but it needs to be managed. That is a, an attractive parcel, and if we just lie back in the weeds to see what develops with respect to that parcel, we will not do as well as if we had strong guidelines that developers and other people who want to improve their property would use. So in an essence, this issue is all about change. Now, uh, I want to thank you again for coming. This is a co-hosted event, and I want to introduce uh, our partner on this issue. That gentleman is Ned Barnes, who is the chair, or the president, rather, of the Civic Association of Palm Beach. Greetings, everyone. I'm so glad you could come out today. It's great to have you here. And on behalf of the Civic Association, we're very proud to be able to partner in this opportunity with the Citizens Association. Our speaker today is Town Councilman Michael Pasillo, and we are very, very fortunate to have Michael with us today because he knows a lot about the PUD-5. He's been thinking about it and little else for the last two years. Mr. Pasillo um, is going to lead a walking tour for us, uh, the Civic Association, on uh, a week from Friday on the 21st, just before the referendum. So if, if you want to see the street firsthand after today, uh, if you want to go around and look at what would change and what would not change uh, with Mr. Pasilla, you're more than welcome to do that. We're happy to welcome this outstanding public servant who will speak to us about the PUD-5 and answer your questions. Please join me in a round of applause for Councilman Michael Pasilla. Thank you, Ned, for that, uh, that very nice introduction. Uh, it was 57 hours we spent uh, with the Royal Ponciana Way Committee over one year. It seems like countless hours. Uh, but we spent quite a bit of time and we had a lot of help, I had a lot of help with some very distinguished members of our community in Palm Beach who served on that as well uh, and gave their time. And the PUD-5 proposal was a product of that. It started when I was uh, not actually asked but told that I was going to direct the, uh, the Royal Ponciano Way Study Committee by then Council President David Rossow. Uh, I sat down and I looked at the zoning code and I, I read through the zoning code provisions and I saw that we had a historic preservation PUD already in our code for uh, residential properties, the PUD-4, uh, which was uh, enacted, I believe, in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, and specifically used to save one of Addison Meisner's uh, famous homes, Warden House, and it was turned into a condominium and saved from the wrecking ball, and I thought, well, that's a good start. Why don't we think about doing something like that along those lines in connection with commercial mixed-use properties? So uh, we started with that premise, and the premise was basically, let's figure out what we like and figure out a way to preserve what we like through incentives. And what we don't like, let's figure out a way to make sure what replaces that is consistent with the architecture, the feel, the character of the street. So that was the basic. Uh, starting point and the starting premise upon which the PUD-5 was based. And we talked a lot about a lot of issues. Uh, I've got some slides today I'm going to go through in a moment, but uh, before I do, I'll just say a few points that I think, uh, to me at least, resonate in terms of, of this whole debate. When I looked at the CTS zoning, uh, I saw a zoning that was not compatible with Palm Beach, not compatible with Raw Ponciana Way, and not compatible with a pedestrian-friendly Main Street. Uh, the CTS zoning was adopted by the Town Council in March of 1980. And virtually everything on that street, except actually in that five-acre area, except for one building, uh, predates the 1980 adoption of the CTS zoning. Uh, CTS zoning is extremely parking-intensive. It is, in my view, 
a zoning scheme that is really designed for a suburban area. Uh, and I've said it's, it's essentially the same parking requirements as PGA Boulevard. One parking space for every 200 square feet of retail, one parking space for every 250 square feet of commercial. When you start doing the math and you start thinking about, okay, a 2,000 square foot um, uh, retail area, that's 10 parking spaces on site, not on the street, but on site. Uh, you start to get the picture uh, of what this would look like. The one building that has been constructed since uh, the, the advent of CTS zoning in 1980 is the Bonner Medical Office that you can see when you come out of Publix. And if you look at that building, it looks like it's on stilts because it's the whole first floor is parking to support the second story, which is about a 3,000 square foot medical office. And unfortunately, that is the type of parking intensive requirements that CTS zoning has. So I said we've got to come up with something that really is, is, is fundamentally different from that. We've got to give some breaks in the parking. So one of the biggest and I think the most significant factor uh, in the, the PUD-5 is the fact that it gives essentially a pass on first floor retail parking requirements. So if you've got a first floor retail establishment, you know, the type of retail properties you would see on a traditional Main Street, you don't have to provide on street parking. As we look at some of the properties we're going to look at today, that's very significant because in order for those properties to have the required parking, you'd essentially have to tear down the buildings that are there and put in drive aisles. Drive aisles that cross the sidewalk and put parking lots in. And parking lots, while they certainly serve their purpose, and I, uh, I understand that, they're not really consistent with uh, a sort of typical Main Street. So as I see the fundamental issue in this election on the PUD-5 is, what do we want for the future of Royal Ponciana Way and that area that includes Sunset? Do we want a pedestrian-friendly Main Street uh, consistent with what's already there, or do we want eventually to have developed something that will look like a suburban area that could be any place in the country? And to me, that's the most significant issue because I believe if the PUD-5 is enacted, it is an option. People don't have to use it but there are incentives to use it. And hopefully by incentives rather than government dictates, property owners will use the PUD-5 in a way that will preserve the buildings that are worth preserving, tear down the buildings that are not worth preserving and put in its place something that is consistent with, um, consistent with this Main Street feel that I think everyone in this town loves and wants to see preserved. I know those who oppose the PUD-5 essentially, I believe, have the same goal. They want to see the PUD, they want to see this area preserved. We just disagree on the best way to do it. I happen to think that uh, the managed approach of the PUD-5 is the best way. And there's a great deal of preservation in the PUD-5. There is no preservation on the CTS zoning. Essentially, everything on that five-acre block could be torn down with the exception of the Bradley House, which is landmarked, Everything else could be torn down. Under the PUD-5, we have a contributing building report. The contributing building report was prepared by Jane Day, the town's longtime landmark consultant, and she cataloged every single building on the five-acre area. Eleven of those buildings are in the highest categories, historic and architecturally contributing to the character of the street. In a PUD-5 development, those buildings cannot be torn down. They can be restored, they can be renovated, and hopefully they will be renovated, they can be adapted to modern day use, but they can't be demolished. Under the CTS zoning, those buildings could be demolished tomorrow. There's in seven other buildings that are in the category of urbanistically contributing. Urbanistically contributing is a, cat is a term that was coined by Stephen Muzon, uh, who we hired as to do prepared design guidelines, which are also part of the PUD-5, and that was his term. And essentially what that means is the building itself may not have significant architectural or historic qualities, but it does contribute to the character and the feel of the street in a way that is positive, that we want to preserve those characters. In, in the case of Testa Restaurant, which we'll, we'll start with in a minute, um, it essentially is the front of the restaurant. A uh, couple of quick points, and then I'm going to go to the slides. Density, a lot of discussion has been made about density. Yes, the PUD-5 has incentives to increase density. CTS is, allows six units per acre, PUD-5 allows 10, and in two circumstances allows 13. Those 13 are if you have put your parking underground. Why? Because we don't want to look at parking lots. We want a main street. We don't want to be staring at parking lots. Um, one of the other requirements is you have 30% open space in the PUD-5 and parking lots don't count. 
So if you put your parking underground, and there's a, probably only one or maybe two buildings that could do that, uh, you're able to go to 13. The other way that you're able to go to 13 is if you're coming down in your density to 13. Uh, we're talking about density levels of 10 and 13 units per acre. The highest density on that street right now on Raw Ponciano is 64 units per acre. And we'll see that building in a minute. The highest density in that block is 88 units per acre. So we've got some pretty high density properties there. And part of the PUD5 density reduction provisions are if you come down, bring your density down 50% or more and down to 13 units per acre, you don't have to provide parking for the new units that you have. And we get into some of the units, uh, uh, some of the properties, you'll see how exactly that works. Finally, one last point, and then we'll go to the slides. Large-scale development. There's been a lot of concern expressed about city place and large-scale development. The PUD-5 prevents that in two ways. First, it has a specific limit. You can't have a PUD-5 development in excess of 1.5 acres. The test of property is about 1.32 acres, so it's just above that. The other way it prevents it is by designating these buildings throughout the block that are architecturally and historically contributing and can't be torn down. They're scattered throughout the block, and that's a further check on any mass development. CTS has no such protection. Under CTS zoning, if someone could figure out how to do the parking, they could essentially do a four and a half acre development there. Um, uh, there's no such restriction on the size. So uh, enough of talking in general terms. Mike, if we can get started on the, uh, on the slides. I've got to start with Testa's restaurant. This is an urbanistically contributing building under Jane Day's report. And it probably has more characteristics that are identified for preservation than any of the other urbanistically contributing buildings. If there's a development of this property, the front that you see of this restaurant would have to be preserved. Uh, under CTS, if someone bought this 1.32 acres, I have no doubt that that would be torn down. Under PUD5, they have to save the front two rooms, the upstairs, even the neon signs, which, by the way, our code now prohibits. Um, and uh, the feel of this, re of this sidewalk seating is very important. It, this property was built in 1947. Draper Babcock is the architect, not one of the great well-known architects. So it's not a great architectural work, but it really contributes to the feel and character of the street. So it would have, that front would have to be preserved in any PUD5 development. This is the back of Testa's restaurant. Uh, this does not need to be preserved. And this is the type of thing where we would like to see removed and something uh, a little more attractive placed. Mike. The gas station. The gas station portion of this property is 100 by 125. This is, one of the, this is a non-contributing building, as you would expect. It can and should be torn down. Uh, and I suspect will be torn down under PUD5 or under the CTS zoning. Um, what can go in its place? This is one building which is not contributing and the non-contributing structures on the street, and there are two of them, we'll get to the other one in a few minutes, can go to three stories. They can go to three stories, however, the third story can only be 35% lot coverage. Both CTS and PUD5 have 70% lot coverage. Uh, PUD5 says if you put a third story, which you can in two places on Royal Ponciano Way, you have to limit it to 35% um, to lot coverage. Uh, CTS, you can get a second story by special exception, which is essentially a given since the burden's on the town to prevent it, and you can get a variance for a third story. So I would submit the height differences are not material. Um, let me go on to the next slide is the park. Okay, the next slide is one last thing about Testa's before we go on to this property. I'm, I fear that if, if, if the Testa property is developed under CTS zoning, a very, very substantial portion of that property is going to be parking lot because they don't have the abatement for first floor retail. They don't have the grandfathered status for the restaurant for parking. And I've calculated you may have to put as many as 130 parking spaces on that, on that street or on that property. All right, this property is an urbanistically contributing um, property. Uh, it's got first floor, it's got a number of architectural details that are, that are uh, highlighted in the contributing building report. It also has seven residential units on this property. And this is one of the properties that I think uh, is another property that's prime for use in the PUD-5. It's owned by Les Evans, and Les has said that he will develop it under the PUD-5 if it's approved. It's got seven residential units on a little less than a fifth of an acre. 
The density is 38 units per acre. So in order to, compl to comply with the density reduction provisions, uh, well, first of all, the first floor retail, whatever he does on first floor retail, he would not have to, have to provide parking. And why is that significant? Well, there are actually three residences on the first floor of this property behind those shops. There are three little cottages. They're not in the best of condition. And at some time, if the gate's open there, you can see the gate in the middle. Walk down there and you'll see those properties. In fact, if you come on the tour, you can see them because we go down there. Uh, you'll see three residences in the back there that are not in the best of shape. Under CTS, if you tried to convert those residences to shops, to retail, have to provide parking. Got to provide parking for new, for new retail. You would not need to provide parking under the PUD-5. If, with respect to the residences there, if the owner comes from seven units down to two and makes two nice residential units, one possibly on the second floor that we see and one possibly on the, uh, uh, the right side of the building, um, they would not have to provide parking for those two residences. And someone would say, well, gee, you don't have to provide parking for residences. Yes, that's true, but there's seven residences there now without a lick of parking. So the theory is two without parking is a lot better than seven. Let's go on to the next picture. This is, again, the same property, and you can see the far side there. Um, this is a building has no access to sunset, this whole uh, one-fifth of an acre, I have no doubt that it would be torn down under CTS zoning because there's simply no way you can get the parking on this property to comply with CTS zoning. So in terms of density, if it's developed under PUD-5, you're going to see five less residential units. You're going to see a preservation of the property. And there's actually, if you walk back there, if there's 30 percent public open space as PUD requires, you could really have a nice courtyard with a lot of nice retail coming in and a couple of, maybe a couple of of condominium apartments on the top, but a very nice retail space. Uh, the 30% open space could be easily met there behind the, uh, the Rapunzel shop. Okay, let's go on. This is another property. This was built in 1945. The architect is Gus Moss. This is the highest density that faces Royal Ponciano Way. There's eight residential units there. You can see four uh, window air, air conditioners up top. And there's another little building in back. There's a courtyard behind this building, which is really a quite beautiful courtyard. And then there is another little building with four more residential units. So there's eight residential units on one-eighth of an acre, 64 units per acre. And there's an opening in the middle that takes you back there down to the back courtyard. Well, under PUD-5, all of the retail on the first floor would, would, be, uh, would not have to provide parking. If they put some retail facing the back courtyard, that would also be fine without parking. Uh, some of the re residential is on the first floor on the way back. That could be converted to retail without parking. And if they converted from eight residential units to two, coming down within 13 units per acre, they would not have to provide parking for, um, for those two new residential units. So the bottom line is, is a building like this can be preserved, it can be rehabilitated, uh, it can be turned into something I think quite attractive with that courtyard in the back and I would encourage you next time you're over there, even though it's got a no trespassing sign, sneak down the alley and take a look at that courtyard because uh, it's really quite pleasant and, and could be a very nice area. Um, so a lot could be done with this building. Uh, and again, just this building and the, the one we looked at previously, a reduction of six units, a reduction of five units, that's 11 less residential units. That will more than offset anything Testis could do. If you don't have PUD-5 as an option, what's going to happen with this building? Well, it's got no access to sunset. Uh, if you're going to put new retail, if you're going to put uh, uh, new residential, you're going to have to put parking. And that, there's no place to put parking. That building's coming down. Uh, that building is it's not going to is not going to survive under CTS. Someday someone's going to want to do something there and tear it down. And if you see the building now, it's not in terrible condition, but it's not in the best of condition either. Now, this is a this is another great great. This is a non-contributing building. It's the bank building. It was built in the mid 70s. It's one of two buildings on the street that complies with CTS zoning. It has lot coverage. It's 20, it's the whole property here in the front, and the, this goes all the way back to Sunset. They've got a total of a half an acre, half an acre here, 20,000 square feet. Uh, this building is 2,800 square feet. 
the way this built this property maps out is you have 14 percent lot coverage of the building and 86 percent parking lot and drive aisles. It's got 15 parking spaces to service this in the back. Mike, we switch to the back. It's got this parking. You notice the lots don't line up. That's the Gus Moss building we looked at. The, the lots are catty corner, and for that reason, I think um, you really could not get underground parking here in my view, so they'd be limited to the 10 units per acre under PUD-5. But most of this property, 86% of it, is basically a parking lot. Uh, and I, I tell people I think that's the future of, of, uh, of, of that street if we don't come up with something other than CTS zoning. Mike, can we go back to the, uh, the yeah, a word about this. You know, this is not a, a, a bad-looking building. It's not in poor repair. It's not uh, an eyesore or anything, but if you look at this building, you think this could be Southern California, Texas, Miami, Boca, or anywhere else. It doesn't have that feel uh, of Royal Ponciana Way. And, you know, it's got two drive aisles, so it's got automobiles driving across the sidewalk. Automobiles driving across the sidewalk are about as unpedestrian friendly as you can get. And, and that's kind of the future if we don't come up with something else. It's not an eyesore, it's not a bad building, but it just doesn't fit in. And the massive amount of parking, this is a, this is a, a building that was designed for the automobile, not for the pedestrian. I love to point this building out. This is the highest density in the, on the entire five acre block. It's architecturally contributing and would have to be preserved. It's also 12 condominiums, so it's gonna be preserved no matter what. Uh, it's got 12 separate condominiums on uh, 1.35 acres. The density is 88 units per acre. Uh, it's an Art Deco style building. It was built in the 1950s. Uh, it was owned by a good friend of my mother, mother's for many years. Um, I point this out, one, because it is the highest density at 88, 88 units per acre in the five acre area. And the other, it's right adjacent to the bank parking lot. You can see some of the, the, the parking spaces there. It's situated in such a way that it further precludes some massive development because this building under PUD-5 is not going down. It's also got 12 condos, so it's unlikely to go down for that reason as well. But that's further a protection against some massive development that's going. Main Street News, 1919. It's a uh, historically uh, uh, contributing building. It cannot be torn down. Uh, it also serves as a buffer and a preclusion of any large development. It also has four residential apartments on, on, the, on this second floor. Density level is 60 units per acre. This building is not going anywhere under PUD-5, and I hope, it, I hope it doesn't go anywhere at all because I think it's, it has a lot of character whether it's developed under PUD-5 or not. Let me just say in summary, um, Obviously, I believe strongly in the PUD-5. I think it's a way that we can, we can see a preservation of our Main Street. It tries to give incentives uh, to preservation. It also tries to give incentives to uh, uh, reduce density as well as increase density. I've said I think at the end of the day, the density is going to be about the same either, either way, a little more, a little less, not materially different. Um, so I think it's a well thought out, well considered concept, uh, and I would hope you su would support it and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, and I assume I can just take them from the, uh, from the podium here. The question, for those who didn't hear it, is what are the most cogent arguments against this moving forward? Um, that's a tough one for me to answer, because uh, I don't think there really are any good arguments against it. Um, you know, I suppose that height is one of the arguments that people will say, um, because you have to get a variance under, under the... Um, under CTS zoning to get to a third story. Um, you cannot get to a third, well you get to a third story on two properties on the street. You know, and then Bill Cooley had a picture of 43 feet, uh, which is actually not the height of the top floor, third floor, it's actually the top of the roof. Um, and by the way, under the code normally it would be 45 and we reduced it to 43. Um, you know, we considered a building today at the town council, a two-story building with a high pitch roof on Brazilian Avenue that was 36 feet. Uh, I just don't see 43 feet as a significant argument. Um, uh, some people, I think, uh, think that if you reduce parking or might have less parking, you know, th that's a negative. 
You know, but I think fundamentally we have to decide what do we want? Do we, do we want a pedestrian-friendly street uh, or do we want a street that's dictated by the automobile? And yes, you know, we've all been to places in the United States and elsewhere outside this country uh, that are beautiful old uh, main streets and they've got their little apartments on the top floor. Europe has got plenty of them. And yeah, they're not very automobile friendly, but, but that's almost the quality that makes them what they are. And, and that's what we have in this street 100 years later. Um, and uh, you know, that's what I think, I think the majority of people want. So yeah, I, I agree that you know, parking may be a little bit difficult, but you know, it, it's worth, I think it's worth preserving. All the way in the back in the blue. I'm not running this thing, but. This is not, this is not a debate. However, if these ladies have a question to ask of our interlocutor, you invited she them certainly so you may. Uh, I'm running this meeting, not you, sir. You made the and statement. And the point is that if this person would like to ask a question, she certainly may. All right? Thank you. Uh, on the parking study, if you come in here with a proposal for a PUD-5, if someone wants to develop testers, you will have to come in with a parking study. I mean, there's nothing, uh, I mean, this notion of no parking study is, I think, uh, uh, you know, first of all, there have been plenty of parking studies in this town um, up until now. We had a parking study done on just what the parking requirements were under CTS zoning. And I went and read through that parking study. And, you know, I said, okay, you've got, in the Ponciano, Royal Ponciano Way side here, you've got 98,000 square feet of space. To comply with the parking with just for what's there, you'd have to have 63,000 square feet of parking. So we've done a lot of parking studies. But to answer your question, if someone wants to do a development, you have got to do a parking study. Well, you've got to do a traffic study, too. I mean, you know, you, you've, the, one of the things that about, which I didn't get into on the PUD-5, but is, is, a, is a relevant point and re relevant to your question, is if you have a PUD-5 proposal, it's got to go before the Planning and Zoning Commission, which will require traffic and parking. You've got to go to landmarks, not, not ARCOM, landmarks, because landmarks is, is basically used, and our landmark code governs approval of these things because landmarks deals with older buildings and the renovation of older buildings. And then you've got to go through the town council. So you've got three hoops you've got to get through to get a specific proposal approved. And, you know, they're going to have to come up with a parking study. If whoever develops testers is going to have to come up with a parking study, whether it's under PUD-5, under CTS zoning, or whatever. It's going to have to have a parking study. For you. The question was, why hasn't this been handled by the Zoning Commission, or the, what now is known as the Planning and Zoning Commission, and actually now is just doing zoning, so the Zoning Commission again. Um, it actually was handled by the Planning and Zoning Commission. They initially handled the TESTA application. It came to the Town Council with a recommendation for approval at 15 units per acre. The Town Council voted that down. and. Uh, at that meeting, David Rosshaus said, we're going to have this blue ribbon committee, and he said, Michael's going to handle it, unbeknownst to me. Um, so what I did is I had a year's worth of committee meetings, and then we made our report to the council. And the council then sent this back to the Planning and Zoning Commission. And the Planning and Zoning Commission in March and April of 2013 had two meetings on this, and they ultimately approved it. I believe it was 7 nothing or 6-1 and sent it back up to the council. So the Planning and Zoning Commission has gotten involved in this, but the council really sort of took it away from them. Uh, and I won't put words into the mouth of my colleagues, but I think that the reason it was taken away from P&Z was the concern that this had been kicking around for about six years, and uh, uh, no offense to P&Z, but they hadn't somehow f gotten something that was going to work. And no offense, we got a commissioner here. Uh, I'm reading David Rossow's mind, perhaps, when I say that. But, uh, so it, but it did go through P&Z. Well, you've got a building that's over 43 th feet tall right there on the block now, and that's the Bradley House. Uh, it's well over 43 feet high, and it's a landmark building. It's one of the most, it's one of the most attractive buildings in the area. Um, so, I mean, I, I, if, if, you, you know, if you want to go look at that and see if that dominates and towers over, uh, over the rest of the buildings, I invite you to do so. Um, 
I mean, 43 feet, you can only have 43 feet in two places on Raw Ponciano Way. Yes, you can have more, more 43 feet ultimate top heights um, but rem on, on sunset. But remember, 43 feet is basically a three-story building with about um, up to 30, several feet on the, above, below the base. And then the, the top of the ceiling is 35 feet. And then you've got eight foot for a roof or five foot for a flat roof if you want. So yeah, you could build something that's 40 or 43 feet. But you know, if you look at Royal Ponciano Way and you look at that area, uh, there's, there's three-story buildings all over the place. If you go back up to County Road, uh, across the street from the John Voke building, uh, which go, essentially wraps around the whole east coast east corner of that, from Royal Ponciano Way to Sunset, across the street you've got three stories there. So um, you know, I understand 43 feet, but if you you know if you look around, there's a lot of 43 feet, foot buildings already there. I'll take one more question if there is one, and then I can turn it over to. That's the, the question was the bank building. What's the worst case scenario and the best case scenario? Um, I think if that building were developed under uh, CTS zoning, you'd have, again, a massive amount of parking because you're going to have to have parking for whatever goes. If you tear that building down, you put retail on the first floor, you're going to have to have parking for that retail. You could put three residential units now under CTS on the second floor of that building. Um, and you're going to have to have parking for that too. So you're going to get a lot of parking in the back there. You're going to essentially get what you've got now uh, with a big parking lot in the back. Under PUD5, you're going to have some parking because you're going to have to have parking for the residential. So if you had five uh, residential units, you still, could have t you still would have 10 parking spaces in the back, but much less lot coverage. And you wouldn't have to have any parking, and you'd have to have 30% public open space vias that you could walk on. I mean, the 30% public open space is another big factor uh, that I haven't talked about too much, but uh, every, pro every developed property under PUD5 has got to have 30% public open space. That's via, uh, vias, courtyards, that type of thing. Uh, I'm not saying we're trying to, to replicate via Miser and via Parigi, but it's that type of concept, and we do not count parking lots towards that open space. Lou? Yeah, what is it that prevents massing on the site? Well, it's the, two, it's the two things I mentioned before, 1.5 acre limitation on, under PUD5 and also the fact that if you look at the map, these contributing buildings are scattered throughout. Unless there's any questions, why don't I give the no crowd some okay. chance to talk and you can, you can judge for yourself at the end of their presentation and uh, maybe you'll have some questions for them too. First of all, I want to say that we did not come planning to speak, and it's not intended to be a debate, so I understand that, and I, and I thank the Civic and the Citizens Association for inviting our presence here. I'm not going to get into a lot of little details. We have a table in back with literature. The other side has a table in back with literature, and if you're willing to study up, then you should stop at the tables and look. But I would say, um, uh, one of the things that keeps being bantered about is that we, what could happen under the current CTS zoning is so terrible that we better fix it. And in fact, if it could have happened, it probably already would have happened. That's our position. And the fact that the council has had very onerous parking requirements has been, I've said to people before, so if you've heard me say it, I apologize. It's kind of like a parent with a curfew. Everyone that wants to do anything has to go in front of the council. And yes, there are a lot of variances granted. And the reason there are a lot of variances granted is that the parking requirements are particularly strict. So the council has always been in the driver's seat and able to say no to the kind of strip mall thing that you're hearing about. Also, it probably wouldn't have been financially doable. So it probably wouldn't happen, this horrible big development that's going to happen. Our current zoning is one story by right and two story by special exception or variance. What is being proposed is two stories by right and three stories by special exception or variance. And it's currently six units per acre. It's being proposed to be 13 units per acre. And yes, there are things that pre-exist and we have to deal with those. But a little map which maybe could illustrate this better is the red buildings are buildings that could come down. 
Some of these buildings are on Royal Poinciana Way. The bulk of the buildings are on Sunset. So this other picture here illustrates the height of some of these buildings. And this black line here is 43 feet. There's another poster back there that has 43 feet taken from the flag, the banner on Sunset, and the picture is on Royal Poinciana Way. So that even if you're on Royal Poinciana Way and this stays short, you can see that it will dramatically change the skyline, the amount of blue space. And for those of us who live up in the North End, and maybe also for you, I'm not sure, uh, we feel that this is our main street, and this is what makes Palm Beach qualify as a small town instead of a small city. When you come across Royal Palm Way, which is the middle bridge, it's very elegant. It's a financial district. It's three stories, sort of a canyon, and that's fine because it's our financial district. And then we have our upscale shopping on Worth Avenue, and we feel like we'd like this to say small in scale. I do think it was misrepresented because we're not against change. We would like to see it stay small. And I think when you talk to people, the problem that people are most upset about is the gas station. And the gas station could have been fixed while they sorted out their variances with a hedge in front and we wouldn't be looking at it. I think without getting any further than that, that's kind of our position. It's not that we don't want any change. We'd just like to keep it very, very small scale and keep it a small town. So, Bill, you had a question? Oh, that's, that is important because the, the, this whole plan does change the, the, the comprehensive plan and the thing that I didn't say, I'm not going to get into the, I don't, I'm not a lawyer and I don't want to go into the details because I don't understand all of them. The only thing that I do understand is that the law of this entire country is based on precedent. So whatever we do here, you better be prepared to do it all through town because precedent. I mean, if, if you do it here, the people who have vacancy on South County will be able to say, you did it for them, what about me? And I would, I would sue for that if I were on South County. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made by having this kind of development. Anyway, this is not our meeting. Thank you very much for the time. Red here. You can't get three stories here or here or here or here. The only two spots on Royal Ponciana Way that you can get stories are these two right here. These are contributing buildings. And you can back here. Exactly. But you cannot here or here or here or here. The green is urbanistically right. contributing. So the front of those buildings cannot be changed. But right. behind them can be changed. You cannot have three stories over here. You okay. cannot have three stories on any contributing building, including urbanistically contributing buildings. Even behind? Yes. Now, once you get behind the once you get behind the center line and you get on the sunset, then you can. But here, you cannot have three stories. And I know this has been some level. You certainly can't have three stories here. You can't really have anything here because you've got no access to parking anywhere. All you can do is put one story right here. Um, you can't put three stories here. You can't put it here. And if this is part of the same property, you probably could actually could, could probably put something. Uh, one, one more thing I just want to touch on. Uh, someone asked a question about the comp plan, and, and I want to just uh, mention that. Um, the comprehensive plan currently allows the maximum density in the town of 13 units per acre. Now, I've shown you all these high-density areas, which are well in excess of the comp plan. One of the first things I said is we will not exceed 13 units per acre no matter what because that's the comprehensive plan, and I felt it would be inappropriate. Uh, in fact, one of the things that, that P&Z was criticized for was going above 13 units per acre. So we're not, I said we're not going to go beyond 13 units per acre. The density across the street along Bradley Place is 13 units per acre, right across the street from this area. The density in Midtown on the ocean is, thir is currently 13 units per acre. They're all more than that, but that's the current density at 13 units per acre. Along the lake in Midtown is 13 units per acre. So, there are some changes to the comprehensive plan, but I would characterize them as technical to allow for the existence of this PUD-5. They are not um, 
uh, we're not changing the density in the comprehensive plan. We are staying within 13 units per acre. And believe me, I viewed that as a line that we would never cross uh, because I knew exactly what would happen if we did. And uh, that's why 13 units is the maximum. So I want to thank, I want to thank uh, Ned and Lou for having this. I want to thank all of you for coming out. Rachel, thanks for contributing as well. Uh, I, I'm around. If anyone has any questions, I can answer some more questions.